uh, about two years ago, I uh, became fascinated with this question that I'm now writing a book about. And um, the question is, what makes people on the inside of institutions, whether corporations or military units or um, government agencies, say no? Uh, say no to an order, uh, to a duty that conflicts with, uh, with their principles and convictions. Um, we all remember a couple years ago, uh, 2003, uh, when the uh, photographs uh, of Abu Ghraib were published. Uh, 60 Minutes fe did a feature, The New Yorker ran a story, and uh, as a culture, as a, as a uh, nation, uh, Americans had to react and, and digest this information. Uh, we probably wouldn't have known about those photographs if it weren't for a reservist, who um, Joseph Darby, who passed along the pictures um, to an investigative unit of the uh, a criminal investigative unit of the U.S. Army. Uh, several steps down the road, this becomes uh, a big uh, altering uh, event in our lives. Um, I want to know what makes people like Joseph Darby do what they do, um, and uh, in a sense. Uh, we, um, we know much less about these people than we do about another kind of dissenter. Uh, when we think about dissent, we generally think about um, ideologically driven uh, groups of people, uh, whether from the left or the right, who, um, who have an explicit goal and do something in a kind of highly premeditated way. You know, we don't want our taxes raised, or we want uh, universal health care. Uh, the people I'm writing about uh, are very different. They're generally operating alone. Uh, they often don't have um, an ideology that they're aware of, although I think we all, to some extent, do have an ideology. But it's something that they become aware of almost through the course of taking action and coming forward. And they go from being uh, very straight-laced insiders to being whistleblowers or uh, you know, uh, people who are seen as uh, rebellious. Um, I'm the, bo the book I'm writing is, is uh, an effort to explain both why these people do what they do and what the social and political consequences are. Sure. Well, one of the uh, characters in the book is a, um, a border guard uh, who, uh, during World War II, was given an order to uh, prevent Jewish refugees from entering uh, his country. And uh, this was the law. The law is something that a border guard and a chief of police, he was the chief of police in this uh, area, um, of course has to enforce. Uh, and this guy was a conservative, law-abiding person. Um, he has to do what he, what he has to, in a sense, follow the order, um, and he decides not to. It's not as though it was imposed uh, on the country by uh, an authoritarian ruler or a dictator. Uh, in those cases, uh, I think we all agree that the law, to the extent we even call it the law, has no legitimacy. It is, it is perfectly in the right of citizens, if they have the courage, um, to uh, disobey. In a democracy, it's a very different question. Uh, you know, generally speaking, the law carries a presumption of legitimacy. Um, and if nobody carried out, if, if officials didn't carry out the, the orders they received or enforced the laws, we would have a state of anarchy. On the other hand, in, in this particular case, looking back on it with time, we see very clearly that um, you know, the choice was enforce the law and leave, pe leave helpless people uh, to um, be sent to death camps uh, or uh, let desperate refugees in and deal with the consequences of disobeying a law that maybe should be up for debate uh, in a country that is a democracy with a tradition of priding itself on letting refugees in. Um, so this case is just, to me, very fascinating and sort of dramatizes, um, in a sense, what, what some of the book is about.